All right, what's going on, everyone? Thought we'd talk a little bit of air defense today. And to do that, we've got Habitual Line Crosser from TikTok and YouTube, also known as Sergeant Long, who is a U.S. Army air defender out of Fort Sill, Oklahoma, who's working with this stuff every day. So thanks so much for taking the time, man. Looking forward to this. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. It's, uh, it's always exciting to be, be here with you. So, Air defense has been top of mind in this conflict for months now. And just before we got started, you were talking about how frequently used air defenders are all around the world, but it hasn't really been, in my opinion, at least top of mind in the United States. So what are you, when you're looking at this conflict, what are some of the major takeaways you're getting just right out the gate um, that we'll be able to apply going forward here in the United States? Well, um, I guess I can start off with uh, seeing what the system can do. Uh, we'll talk with the Patriot side of the house first. Yeah. Um, I have trained with this system. I have built air battles for the system. Our air battles fall under under a management level, which uh, air battle management level one through air battle management level 16. And I've written every single one of those. Um, what you saw in Bakhmut, I believe, or not in Bakhmut, in Kiev in, on the 18th is around ABML 5 territory, which um, is not unimpressive at in the least, right? Um, it is incredibly impressive, but that's considered our basic air battle management level, which uh, kind of puts it into perspective um, what the system can really do. Um, what people are seeing now is what air defenders have known for, for quite a long time. Uh, we've trained the system, but we fell into this weird part of the, of the military where the only people that cared about air defense was air defenders and COCOM commanders, because a COCOM commander would create a new asset and on the draw, he would say, he or she would say, well, hey, there's a missile threat. Let's put Patriot there. Let's put Shorad there. Let's put LPWS there. And then that's, they just get to check the block. But because we were fighting insurgencies for so long, no one really tried these air defense systems with the exception of the occasional mortar or artillery from like the mm -hmm. Taliban or Al Qaeda. So the systems were there, they were employed, air defenders were toe on the line, doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing for long periods of time. It's just nobody ever tried, with the exception of like January 2022, uh, where US Patriot and Emirati uh, Thad engaged and destroyed um, some missiles that the Houthi rebels had fired out of Yemen, uh, showing that air defenders, no matter what, no matter how long, we don't get complacent. It's something can happen and we need to be ready for it because we don't have the privilege of a second chance. This also seems like one of those things where, because we weren't using Patriot in Afghanistan or for Iraq for a long time, yeah. um, that the assumption was that maybe the Patriot hasn't advanced or that air defense hasn't advanced. On the other hand, a lot of the, the Russian media was talking about the advances in their missile technology. Yeah. Um, that didn't seem as prevalent in the air defense space. So I wonder if there was a little bit of, um, I don't know. That the, the, the opinions were just lagging, that the Patriot is old and the Russian missiles are new. So it was a little bit surprising then to see them be effective in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, there's that's a, a really big opinion that I've ran into out there as well, is that Patriot is not advancing at all. The system never changed anything. And the reality is we have gone through hundreds, maybe even thousands of software and hardware upgrades. The original Patriot system... Um, had CRTs, cathode ray tubes. Um, that's what you would look at was your scope. Now, nowadays, we have touch screens, modern man stations with Recaro racing seats inside of the system. Like that's just a hardware change, right? Uh, which granted a, a more comfortable seat really doesn't make you a better air defender, but it is one of the changes we've had. We've gone from analog systems to digital systems. We've gone from like smooth switch multiplexer units to creating a RIC. Uh, I cannot remember what RIC stands for. Um, which is kind of just a, a digital hub between systems to communicate with one another. We have... So the system, and what's interesting is people were not looking for these advancements until Patriot started being used, with the exception of air defenders and COCOM commanders, because they cared about what the system was capable of defending. Uh, in 20, well, I want to say it was 2020, and this is full public information, the U.S. successfully fired Patriot Pac-3 MSE, which stands for Missile Segment Enhancement. That missile is specifically designed to bridge the gap between Thad and Patriot. Patriot could only shoot so high and Thad could only shoot so low. MSEs were designed to bridge that gap. Can't say what that gap was, but that's what those missiles were there. Um, they successfully, my soldiers actually, and my old lieutenant successfully engaged off of Tippy 2 data. Tippy 2 is the radar for Thad or terminal mm -hmm. high altitude area air defense. Um, and it went very, very far and very, very high. And that was specifically to fill a gap that was in systems that were deployed throughout the world. So we tested it, it worked, and we sent it out. And now the whole world, uh, at least American systems, have that capability, uh, which is further 
um, I guess, make a long story short, just advancing what we have. Uh, we, our software is updated, I uh, shot in the dark every other year, give or take. Um, new threats emerge, new things are detected, things need to be adjusted. It's just a perpetual learning machine. That's the way air defense is because every time we make a mistake, we need to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again. I want to go back to kind of couch something I said. I said that Patriot has been effective in Ukraine and there's so many different variations of this. So I'm interested in your take, but what, what I've tried to relay in videos before is that, you know, a, a Patriot on a test site shoots a missile out of the air, like that's, that's success. They did the job. Mm -hmm. um, but then on a battlefield with 10, 20, 50 simultaneous threats with tired operators and a confusing battle space, success doesn't necessarily always mean that 50 out of 50 projectiles are knocked down. Yes. Um, what are you looking at in terms of, you know, when you're, when you've seen what's come out of Ukraine, the public information that's come out of Ukraine, you know, would you be happy with a 90% greater than that um, or? The goal for all American systems is a 0.9 or better PK, which means 90% or better probability of kill on threats. Now, that doesn't mean that you hit 90%. That means you destroyed 90% uh, through a lot of background processes. We decide if something is a good kill or a bad kill and may re-engage that same target again a second time. Um, honestly, looking at what they've done... Um, and this goes for all air defense systems, American systems, Israeli systems, uh, Russian systems, everything. They protect a certain finite area. Now, if you throw 50 missiles into that area, because American missiles are very, very good. We have great accuracy with our missiles and we need to be accurate with these things to avoid you know, civilian casualties that, that plays into like legitimacy of battle, which is more mm -hmm. doctrinally based. Um, a lot of these people out there are just throwing missiles in a general direction. Well, when you employ an air defense system, its job is to protect something, right? Uh, a base, a building, an asset of some kind. And if that system happens to detect those missiles going outside of that, those are referred to as IP outs or impact point is outside of the asset. Now with that, um, you wouldn't waste missiles on those. It's, it's a really kind of a screwed up part of our job where you more or less have to play God, right? Like, do I prioritize taking care of this farmhouse that may be taking, you know, a Shahed drone here in a second, or do I save my missiles for the threats that are coming towards my asset? Uh, so this goes for all air defense systems. Plus when they're that far outside of your asset, you're, you have staggering reduce in, in lethality there. Sure. So um, I, I guess to kind of circle it all together is, <sighs> You can't always protect everything you want to, but you need to be able to protect what you need to. I guess that would be the easiest way to sum that up. And it does seem like this is, you know, if we dial in on like the information space online, it's been a headache. We're seeing it now with the Western tanks and, uh, and infantry fighter vehicles being used in this counteroffensive. When one gets knocked out, it's, oh, look, they're not invincible. And I, I don't think anybody, any legitimate source was ever saying these things are invincible. I don't think any legitimate source ever said that Patriot is going to shoot down everything that's ever in the sky. Um, but somehow that, that myth has been created to where one item gets through and it still might be a, a good night for the Patriot. And compared to what was there, maybe a lot were shot down that wouldn't have been. Um, but we're kind of battling this information space of it's no good because something got through. Yeah. Uh, the, so I watched the video of the, and I did a breakdown on my YouTube about that video of showing something that got through. Now, the problem with that is there's, they swear that they fired one Kinzel and only one Kinzel got through. Well, you can't fire the, it, number one, it's physically impossible to fire the Patriot system at nothing. You have to hook something in the air and you have to engage that target. You can't just be like, I want my missiles to fly out. You can't do it. It's physically impossible. Um, there is a way to trick the system into thinking something out there is fake, but it takes a lot of time and preparation and you're not going to do that in the middle of a fight. Sure. So um, as for the one that got through, again, it's like a 1997 Hey You Pikachu camera. It's very grainy. Uh, the quality of video there is very difficult, but what was supposed to have gotten through was the Kinzel, which to them would be a terminal hypersonic. Now the phases of flight of a TBM are launch, boost, apogee, separation, and terminal. Almost every single ballistic missile in the world, whether it's air launch, ground launch, wherever, they follow that same trajectory. Now, a terminal hypersonic would be um, something moving faster than Mach 5 or one faster than one mile a second or 1.6 kilometers a second. Now, if it is moving that fast, the interesting part of being hypersonic is you get 
the, the object gets covered in a layer of plasma. Now, plasma is very, very bright. We know this because in 1965, the American Sprint missile would go plasma stealth, which isn't really stealth anymore, but um, within a couple of seconds of being fired because it was moving so fast. It would also cook the object to around 6,200 degrees before it made impact. Um, the reason why I have some questions about that video is if it were a Kinzel that went through and that Kinzel were capable of doing those kind of speeds, you would have seen a bright flash coming towards the ground. Um, you could see the Patriot missiles going out, which are moving at Mach 4 unclassified, and those were on the screen for probably about five, six seconds apiece, which tells me that the frame rate with that camera would catch at least one or two frames of a hypersonic plasma stealth object smacking the ground. So either A, it wasn't a Kinzel, or B, their Kinzel is not capable of being terminal hypersonic, which increases the credibility of the US Patriot system being able to engage and destroy those objects. So that's one of the, the things that's come up a lot is the Patriot can't go as the Patriot can't go as fast as these other missile systems. But I mean, you know, it doesn't have to, right? Like it has to get no. away. So they're coming yep. from two different okay. Yeah, so the object comes down, it's the same principles, baseball, object coming down, let's say it's moving Mach 8, Mach 10, whatever, right? And everyone's like, well, it's moving faster, you can't engage it. If it were an aircraft that were trying to overflight you or drop bombs and take off, yeah, that, that's a factor because you have to get up to that elevation and you have to catch that object. That's why the SR-71 was so hard to hit, but the SR-71 was flying at 60, 90,000 feet, however high it could go, moving at Mach 3.3. So you have to get your missile up to that elevation and then catch that object that is moving at those speeds. As for ballistic missiles, air defense in general works better if it is the target. So you always co-locate your air defense systems with whatever you're trying to protect. So they would try and fire at, let's say an air base. Well, your missile just has to come and meet it uh, wherever it's going to hit, right? And there, people talk about maneuvering, which is a little bit, the best way I can explain countering uh, something moving, maneuvering, is let's say it's maneuvering, trying to avoid air defense systems. I'm super fancy. I'm super fancy. It has to straighten up before it hits the target. I, I guess that's the easiest way to explain that. <laughs> there was a report uh, that I talked about recently that came out from Rusi, and one of the, the topics they got into was how Russia is supposedly using some of these cheaper Shahed or Garand-style drones to find gaps in Ukrainian air defense that could then be exploited by Kinzel or any other type of missile. Um, my original thought there is that those are probably two different types of, of targets yes. that you might like if, if no Garands get shot down, that doesn't mean that there's no Patriot there because the Patriot might not be engaging that target. Is that accurate? Would you be able yes. to talk to that a little bit? So the way they're employing the system is they're doing it with layers. I don't know exactly what the extent of the layers is. So the Patriot has a very specific role because they have nothing else that can do ballistic missile defense in Ukraine. The S-300 has a limited capability, but it's not as good as Patriot. Now I know that's going to sting with a whole bunch of Russian fanboys, but if the S-300 was capable of putting up a good ballistic missile defense, it would have been located in Kiev instead of Patriot. Okay. Um, so, but what they do is they're, they're using it more of a point system, right? So they, instead of area defense, they're creating, we need to protect this small, small, small area with this Patriot system to, you know, utilize the amount of interceptors they have effectively. Um, now they do have Avengers, they have, uh, Stingers, they have, um, Iris T, they have, uh, I think they got NASAMs. I'm not hundred percent certain on NASAMs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they have a whole bunch of other systems. So what they do is the United States and their allies, uh, Israel as well, does a really, really good layered air defense that everybody has a slice of the pie as that object is coming down. Now they're discriminating it and deciding what it is. And they'll oftentimes pick which system has the highest PK or probability of kill on that threat. The same thing is happening in places like Kiev, where you have all of these systems looking in similar areas, but as those targets come in, like a Shahed drone, don't quote me here, it moves at about 150, 200 miles an hour, which sounds fast, but in the world of air and air defense, that's, that's sluggish. That's a snail moving across mm -hmm. your screen, right? Um, so those targets can be intercepted by those Avengers. They can be intercepted by those Iris T's, by those other systems. There's a, a German uh, Gepard, I think they have those yep. as well, the ones with the anti tank cannons, yep. Yeah, those have also been used to great effect from what I'm understanding uh, for these things. So uh, 
everyone's theory of they're going to just send a bunch of drones to find these gaps. Well, there's going to be other things filling those gaps for those drones. So they reserve those Patriot missiles because the people using these systems are not unintelligent. They are very, very smart. And they understand uh, tactics at a very high level and they understand radar theory. And these, I mean, these are doctors, physicists. These are intelligent people operating these systems. The Ukrainians trained on these systems. Yes. So speaking in, of, of the people actually operating the systems, what's the risk of exhaustion when you're operating um, this? Because you, you'll see, I mean, it'll pop up on Twitter, like Russian aircraft airborne and missiles inbound in the next four hours and then drones start impacting. And, and there, there were, there've been stretches where it's, you know, a week or more at a time where those air defenders are got to be at least close to their battle stations. How much of a risk is getting tired? So we, at least, I don't know how they're employing entirely. Um, but for us, I know we run AMD crews, which is air missile defense crews. So each crew is comprised of, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten people. Okay, so you have three inside the ECS, the engagement control station. You have ta your tactical control officer, your tactical control assistant, and your communication systems operator. Those are the guys who fight the fight. Those are the ones who point and shoot. You have two people inside the BCP. I do not know if Ukraine got BCPs. BCP stands for the Battery Command Post. It has like Link 16. It's got JTT, like SATCOM. It, it's a communication hub for situational awareness. Now, then you have five hot crew members. Hot crew are the tangos. They go downrange. They, they reload launchers. They make sure the launchers are up and running. If there's any kind of faults with it, they troubleshoot the launchers. That is their bread and butter, which kind of sucks because for me inside the van, there's no windows. I have to just take it at face value where they tell me they're at and make sure that those launchers are down and ready for them, or I can crush tangos. I can barbecue tangos. I, I mean, there's a lot of danger associated with, I'm just taking it at face value. If they don't tell me where they're at, they can dive very easily downrange. Um, so that, I, I love that all the Russians are like, it takes 70 people to use the Patriot system. No, we use 10 man crews and that's the entirety of the system. So what we do is we have three of those crews available. Now during steady state operations, while we're just kind of watching the skies, doing what we need to do, each of those crews pull a 24 hour shift. Now you can do, you know, you can rotate people through the van and maybe get a little bit of shut eye here. You're doing maintenance, you're cleaning filters, you're, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, but those 10 people are in charge of that site. And then the next day they would do a changeover. They would, Hey, this is what is repaired. This is what needs to be fixed. And they would do a changeover like that. Now during tactical operations, that means there's an active scud fight. That number drops drastically. Like depending on the unit, it can be like eight to maybe even four hours a piece, depending on how heavy that workload is. So if they are using similar tactics, it wouldn't be burning them out as much because you would have one crew in there for eight, 10 hours, however long they want to run it. And the next crew is on site, next crew is on site. It's a continuous thing, allowing those people that downtime to get that breather and, and catch up on some sleep. Makes sense. I, you know, one of the things, one of the uh, critiques or warnings about any Western tech going over to Ukraine is that Russia is going to get their hands on it and they're going to mm -hmm. learn from our systems. And, you know, High Mars, if a rocket doesn't detonate, they can pick up the rocket and take a look at the guidance mm -hmm. system and all that. What's that threat like for Patriot? Like how much do you think Russia is able to discern from our missile defense capabilities based off of what's being intercepted or not being intercepted? So from what I've seen thus far, they severely underestimated the capabilities of that system. They thought, um, I knew the first, when they finally got the system in place and it fired, they fired one Kinzel. That was them probing, but also underestimating, right? They fired the one Kinzel, it was intercepted, right? Makes sense. That's what the system was designed for. It's a ballistic missile. It's nothing more, nothing less. The, what was it, a week later? That's when they were trying to destroy the system. They were do, doing a complex attack. This also kind of shows your enemy's hand um, because they know that there was one system there. They were hoping and associating that there was one system there. So what they did is they threw ballistic missiles, uh, ground-based ballistic missiles, air launch ballistic missiles, some of the Kinzels. They threw th Shahed drones. They threw cruise missiles. What they did is they tried to overtax the system and see if they could get something to go through. Now, I don't know if something got through. Okay. I saw what happened. I'm not really sure if like... It looked like something, yeah. Something, yeah, it, something blew up, right? It, it, it did, but from, from what I've seen... Um, 
the system kept running perfectly fine. Uh, it, it, they didn't even know it, it had taken a hit. I don't know if it was a hit or it was debris I, to this day. I sure. can't tell you, I have no idea. Um, but they were trying to destroy it. Now, Russia needs that victory. They need that, right? They absolutely need that. And you're seeing a lot of propaganda pumped out of Africa, of all places. I'm seeing a ton of African propaganda, uh, which is really weird. A lot of African creators are just repping Russia and believing everything they say. And I would, you know, I try and, like you, take it at face value and, well, let's see what happens next. You know, we want to analyze these things as much as we can. And the system kept shooting. So that entirely fell apart. But sorry, a long story, but going back to how they showed their hand is they threw a complex attack at one system. And that tells me that that amount of complex firepower would overtax their system. So that tells me that they threw what they expected that thing to be overwhelmed with, which means that they, that's what they expect theirs to be overwhelmed with for a single system. Right? So that again, leads into underestimation and overconfidence. And now they're losing lots of munitions. But granted, it's expensive to keep these Patriots firing. Yeah. And, and to be fair, Russian air defense has had a lot of questions asked recently, um, not just with the strikes in Crimea and closer to the front, but some of these small drones impacting around the Kremlin, um, which, mm-hmm. you know, to your point, that's not something that's going to be engaged by the S-400 or probably even yep. the S-300. Um, yep. But yeah, Russian air defense has certainly been... A topic. Well, what's, what I find curious about the S, again, I didn't really know too much about the S300 and S400 and, e, and the, the the pipe dream that is the S500. I've never seen a fully functioning S500. But uh, the S400 um, is that it has a ground attack mode. And historically speaking, and, and you know this from personal experience, if you try to make a system do more than one thing that it was designed to do, it's going to fail at both. And it's going, instead of a master of one craft, it's going to be sure. a jack of all trades and it's going to be half effective at both. Um, Patriot is a defensive system only. You cannot fire to ground targets. You can't, I mean, in theory, I possibly could, but I know of at least five safeties in my head that you would have to override to make that happen. Um, so the fact that they're using it for ground attack, I, I don't know how to take that. Originally I thought it was desperation, but they're continuing it and they have a lot of S 400 munitions. So I, I don't know. 300s, right. I don't think they're, they're not using S 300. Yeah. 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 You're right. I'm sorry. S 300. Uh, if you put them right next to each other, I couldn't tell the difference. I'll be honest with you. Well, so one thing I wanted to get your take on was kind of the difference between what we're talking about with protecting key sites, fixed locations, like airfields or government centers or whatever it is that Ukraine is protecting around the capital and, and kind of transition to the difference between that and the tactical fight. So okay. we watched the, the, you know, an offensive kickoff in Ukraine over the last few days, and there's been a ton of footage of loitering munitions, especially causing a lot of damage against Ukrainian columns. And one of the questions that I've seen pop up is, where's the air defense? And just was hoping you could kind of walk through the differences there because we're not, they're not going to put a Patriot no. at the front lines. What does that look like? Not necessarily what Ukraine would do, but maybe what the United States would do in a similar situation. So air defense in general is a finite resource. Every country in the world wishes they had more air defense, but these systems are expensive to produce. They are hard to man. Um, everybody everywhere to include the US. We wish, I mean, I've I've heard COCOM commanders wish for 50 more Patriot units out there just because we would like to have that much more firepower. Why not? It's it's not realistic. Um, but uh the way we employ things um for our units is we have started embedding our Shorad guys, short range air defense guys with man pad systems. They either got the uh the stingers or now we're talking to even directed energy weapons, directed energy and Shorad just got here to Fort Sill, uh four sixtieth got the first of those systems in the world. Jeez. Um yeah, I don't I don't even know if it's in full production or if this is just a test run. I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's super cool, though. I'm trying to get out there on them. But um, what they started doing is embedding those with BCTs. They would take a Shorad unit and say, hey, you belong to this brigade combat team. And the brigade combat team would then learn through, you know, commander's uh, guidance and all these other things like that. They would go to air defense school a little bit here and there. And they would learn how to employ these these individual man pad teams and directed energy and Avengers and whatever, because those are the ones you're going to want in the front. Now, when it comes to like those loitering munitions, those are cheap, small munitions. Those are line of sight. You should be able to take out those with man pad systems. If they started getting ballistic missiles rained down on them, that's when I would expect 
um, other systems to start moving with the front. Now, the United States did this in 2003. We had Patriot units bounding into Iraq yeah. with, yes, that was a real thing that happened. Um, that's also part of the reason we had a fratricide. Uh, because those systems weren't communicating with the higher echelon unit. They weren't communicating with the air force. They had no comms. They were just doing strictly autonomous operations and they were making their own targets, which is not a way we employ systems anymore. So if we jump somewhere, we're going to have communication nodes all the way back to our command and control. Um, that's how we would employ. But just like you said, you're not going to move a Patriot system forward. Now, again, they have a finite number of systems. So you have to look at the balance between okay, if I move this system forward, does it leave my command center here at Kiev open? Um, do I take that risk, that associated risk with possibly losing soldiers on the front? Or do I think that my front can move fast enough to take out their command and control center so that we can counter these munitions before they even take off the ground? I'm sure that's somewhere in Ukraine, they're having that conversation about what is the risk is associated with keeping our air defense here versus moving some of our air defense forward to support these um, combat operations. I'm going to be honest, man. I feel like we don't have this drone thing figured out quite yet. It, th this, you know, to go back to the same report from Rusi a little while ago, they said that every seven kilometer stretch of the front had 25 to 50 drones up at any given point. That's a massive number at, at yeah. any given point, not, not in a day or in, in a week, like right now up to 50. And so when, when there's major offensive operations, you got to think it's towards the high end, 50 man pads, at the front is, is it's not realistic across a long stretch no. and those drones come down, you shoot down one, there's another one coming. Um, I, I'm not sure there's a, a clear answer to that one quite yet. So for the U S drones have, as they've gotten cheaper, people started raising the, the red flag and understanding that, Hey, we need to be prepared for this threat. And Ukraine has seen the, the evolution of three things that were that have really become the forefront. And I would say number one would be logistics. Logistic support is, has shown its importance tenfold in Ukraine. Uh, number two is the importance of air defense, which is part of the reason that I'm here. Uh, <laughs> and number three is the importance of low cost drones. Now, I wouldn't say the U.S. is, I would, I would never say we're fully prepared for any threat because that's just, that's just wishing somebody would. But we have, we've opened up the drone school at, or the counter UAS school in Fort Huachuca. Um, there's actually going to be another one stationed here at Fort Sill. We have created certain individual systems. We have the SLAM. We have, I give a, there's a whole brief on it. There's uh, like four or five different systems that I'm not familiar with. And I can't really say from memory. They have shoulder fired ones. They have all sorts of different uh, anti-drone systems that are coming forward, which is a step in the right direction. Because I remember years ago, the Air Force would just drive around on the runway and shoot at them with 12 gauges, uh, which is, <laughs> was even a threat for us hey, because they were just you know, looking. <laughs> yeah, it's effective. Um, there is... Uh, Directed energy systems are coming online. Uh, Israel has successfully fielded the first directed energy weapon that has been used in combat, and that's uh, Iron Beam. Um, they, for the cost of about $4, I think it's $3.20, they can down an enemy drone, and they are claiming to have downed enemy rockets, uh, which is crazy. Um, we have the second one, which is directed energy M Shorad, which for the cost of about a gallon of diesel, uh, you can down an enemy drone. But like you said, that's not going to be able to deal with the sheer volume um, that are out there. They're talking about multiple engageable lasers where you can target six or seven drones at the same time and you can just fire once and it'll, it'll track all of them at the same time. These are more futuristic type things that are coming in. Um, we have new radars that are coming online and these radars do have certain little bells and whistles that help out with uh, counter drone defense. So drone defense has become a huge like focus for all of air defense because we realize it's expensive to throw these munitions at um, these little drones. So we need to find cost effective ways to be able to down them, but also highly effective ways against large numbers of them. It, it feels like this might've been a similar conversation when enemy air defenses really came online and the whole concept of suppression or destruction of enemy air defenses. like you can't ignore that part. You have to take care of that before you move any aircraft into the battle space. It feels like we're heading that direction where a team, a even company at the brigade level probably isn't going to do this. Like you have to really handle the drone threat before you start pushing armor forward. It, it can't yeah. be an afterthought. It can't be one guy with a stinger in every platoon. No, and I think um, the, the short-term fix is, this is the same thing when, it's, when we talk about radars, when we talk about jamming, or when we talk about drones, all three of these things require a certain amount of power. 
when you're jamming somebody, you are projecting power through the air. Everyone's like, well, you're, you jammed them. They can't see you. No. If you have multiple sensors looking in that direction, they just know everything is in this one vicinity. And they're going to come looking for you there because you've been projecting this jamming signal out there. So jamming takes a lot of power. Ra radars take a lot of power. And modern aircraft look for those radars. Like, where is that radar at? Oh, it's in this direction perspective to, to my location. Now, um, some of these systems, uh, like the man, man portable ones, the, um, what is it? Um, little ray guns. Yeah. They're little, they look like an M4 on the back end, but on yeah. the front, they got like these two big beams. Um, so they, some versions of that actually, depending on the, the drone itself, they trigger a return to base function. So they hit it and it loses signal and it goes to return to base. So all they do is they, they watch it wherever it's going and go, Oh, okay. Adjust fire shift from known point, And they start bombing the hell out of it to eliminate it at the source. Mm-hmm. So that is at least a short term fix for these so systems. In the span of like 20 minutes, we, we've talked about um, the air defenders trying to engage hypersonic weapon systems that maneuver on their way to a fixed point yep. down to drones you can buy at the shelf at Amazon. Do you think there's ever going to be a split within the air defense community to where, I mean, those are those to me, they sound like very different threats. So there are right now, uh, American air defense, at least in the army side of the house, um, cause there is Navy air defense and there is Marine Corps does actually, they have some stingers as well. We break down into high mad and shore rad high mad is, oh man, high missile air defense. I I've never actually heard what high mad stands for, but I'm high mad Patriot Thad, uh, Aegis technically falls into high mad category. Our job is missiles, expensive, large munitions. Short rad or short range air defense. Those are the the rockets and artillery, the unguided munitions, the the drones. That's those are the more four guys. We consider short rad like the infantry of air defense, but don't let them hear that I said that because they're gonna be like, yeah, we're infantry, whatever. Um, right now, there's this huge separation. Honestly, all air defense systems kind of work in a vacuum for the United States. Yes, we can layer. Yes, we can talk to each other in certain aspects, but we're all off on our own. The way moving forward with AIAMD, which is uh, Army Integrated Air Missile Defense, uh, one of the, you know, several of the systems we have coming online, like um, LTAMs and IBCS, LTAM stands for Lower Tier Air and Missile Defense Sensor, and IBCS is the Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System. What it would be is you're putting multiple systems under one umbrella, and they can all talk to each other and shoot at each other's targets. And that would make air defense more of a self-repairing, self-dedicating network that you could circumstantially control from almost anywhere. Now, I know it sounds, sounds a little Skynet-y, but it will 100% be operator ran, and there's no AI in there telling you what to shoot at. Interesting. Well, as we're wrapping up here, is there much you've, you've learned or picked up on or even studying from the Russian side of things? Um, any tactics or the way that they're employing their systems, failures, anything like that? Um. Honestly, on the Russian side, not really. Uh, it's been more or less what I've expected. I, I really overestimated their capabilities and their um, uh, logistics, their, their support elements, their, their ability to conduct large-scale combat operations. It was actually one of your videos that really broke it down for me, uh, explaining the, the um, difference of command all along the front and how commanders weren't talking to each other. There was no unity of command along the front. Uh, that was really surprising, actually. I thought they were all under under one roof, and they are just, you know, cowboying it out there. They don't want to talk to each other. They don't want to work with one another, and that was so surprising. It uh, sounds like Ukrainian. go ahead. Well, it sounds like that translated to air defense, especially early in the conflict. Yeah, there was a mix up between the air force and the air defenders. What where they needed to be protecting and not, and there were some there were some friendly fire shootdowns for sure early yep. in the conflict. Um, and then a lack of kind of coordinated planning of where those assets needed to be. Mm -hmm. And I, you can call this prediction now. Um, I, I do predict that in the near future, uh, when F-16s get utilized in Ukraine, we will see more friendly fire incidents um, from the Russians. And we may even see them from the Ukrainians. Uh, I, I hope they don't. But right now, Ukraine has nothing in the air, except for a few helicopters here and there. Um, they do have an air force. It's very limited and very far from the front. So they are shooting everything that flies at them. And when you start bringing in uh, friendly air assets, that complicates things exponentially because you have to know that that is a friendly F-16 that went out to go do bombing or wild weasel and it's on its way back. And it may have its IFF or identify friend or foe turned off, which is 
part of the reason the United States engaged our own friendlies in Iraq. It's because they had those things turned off because they didn't want to be projecting codes to everybody. Um, once those systems get there, both sides are going to be detecting more things flying through the air. So mm -hmm. both sides, if they're trigger happy, could end up shooting their own people. Um, so that's that's another associated risk with this. It reminds me of something I meant to ask. There was about a month ago, like in one day, three Russian aircraft went down inside of Russia. Um, and I don't think there's been a source attributed to that. There were, you know, it was friendly fire on the Russian part. There were man pads teams running around in Ukraine, sabotage teams. And one of them was that a Patriot system may have been moved a little closer to the border in an area where Russia felt confident flying that they're out of range. Um, is that as simple as like just moving the Patriot forward and it's, it's good to go? Uh, yeah. So um, the system in a very short amount of time um, can move from one location to another. And the way the system works is as long as you employ it effectively, um, it can map its own surroundings. The radar can look at everything out there and be like, I don't need to look at this. And it'll pay attention to everything above whatever mountains or trees or whatever is around it. Um, so once you get the system there, you just got to, it takes a little bit, a matter of minutes to map an area. And once you're mapped, your radar is good to go. Um, and will engage with aircraft entries. It'll engage aircraft. I mean, we just keep talking about missiles, but it, it there's no changes that need to be made. It'll engage aircraft just as quickly. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you tell it to kill something, it'll it'll just it'll send missiles at it. It'll so the way the system works is you don't I don't pick like I want to fire this missile at this time. I just say I need to kill that, and the system will go okay. If I fire this missile off of this launcher at this second, I will have the highest probability of kill at this threat. It'll do that all in the background. Can you, uh, as we'll wrap up here, but briefly explain the, yeah. how the, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? What do you mean? How aircraft are shot down to the Patriot. I saw it in one of your videos. I think you um, mentioned that you just learned about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't know it was public record uh, or public mm. information. I, I, I didn't know that I was allowed to say it. Uh, there's a lot of things that like, so keep in mind when people are watching this, even the dash 10, uh, like our, our 10 level maintenance manual is considered uh, unclassified, but it's for official use only. So it's not public domain. So I try and stay out of the dash 10. I, I usually reference things from news articles and stuff like that on the internet. And for the longest time, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to, you know, freak anybody out. Cause it, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't substantiate it because they would hear it and they'd be like, Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But in 2003, Lieutenant Colonel Candeloro explained that Patriot doesn't target the aircraft. It's bias is the cockpit. Now it does this for a couple of reasons that I can't really get into. It's not just lethality purposes, but it, it, pretty much comes down on top of the uh, the cockpit of the aircraft. So even if you do eject, you're just ejecting straight into the interceptor that's coming after you. So your chances of survival are staggeringly low. Matter of fact, no pilot that we know of that has ever been engaged by Patriot has ever survived. That's a happy note to end on. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll put your links to YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. Where else are good places to connect with you? Um, actually that's pretty much it. I, I do have a Facebook, but I don't, I don't really post there as much as I could. It's so hard to stay up with all social media, man. <laughs> Facebook's rough. I've dabbed. Yeah. I used to just the personal account for a long time and just kind of stopped using it recently kind of tried to post there a little bit. And Oh boy. Um, yeah, it's interesting, but anyways, we'll put those three below and I'll link a couple of the videos that you talked about in this video about the Patriot strike or the supposed Patriot strikes. People can check that out, but so our long habitual line crosser, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Always good to connect. And uh, oh, of course, we'll talk so. soon. All right, man. We'll see ya.